a story of humble beginnings, hard work, and huge successes. It seems like he was just a classic overachiever. My dad was really generous. They were able to take success in one business and turn it into others. We're looking at the American dream. But one spring morning, the dream was shattered. When the sheet was pulled away, they could see the devastation. The nature of the killings was so brutal, so bloody, so violent. It was like waking up into a nightmare. As investigators search through the emotional wreckage, a killer remains hidden in the shadows, free to strike again. Obviously, we were looking at someone that was extremely troubled. Rumors started that they had ran her off the road or affected the car in some way as to cause the accident. And a community exposes the root of all evil. Money tends to remove a sense of consequence. It did resemble mob hits. 16 guys put it up to He said he started to expose the devil yesterday. Let's bury him today. June 6, 1980, Libertyville, Illinois, an affluent suburb north of Chicago. Shortly after 8 a.m., the local fire department receives an urgent call. Tom Garvin, who is at that time an assistant chief, he and I were in the station. It was early morning when we got a call from the police department. Tom turned to me and said that uh, we were going to the Rouse house that was owned by Bruce and Darlene Rouse, who were big names in the community. At first, all anyone knows is that there has been a reported shooting. It's not a town where there was crime. So a shooting could mean a number of things. It could mean accidental. It just didn't occur to us what we were walking into. First responders are greeted by two of the couple's three children, 16-year-old Robin Rouse and her 15-year-old brother, Billy. Billy was on the phone. Robin pointed. She was screaming. The master bedroom was down a hall. And when you entered the bedroom, Darlene was in the nearest position on the bed. First thing you see, and it's almost surreal because it doesn't look like a person. It almost looks like a doll. Her head is in Kurdish shotgun blast. 38-year-old Darlene Rouse is dead. Lying beside her is the bloody body of her 44-year-old husband, Bruce. Tom proceeded over to Bruce's side and, and told me that uh, he's gone to... I've been on thousands of calls, and many of them have been brutal, but none quite as brutal as this one. Bruce Rouse's path to prominence wasn't a story of rags to riches. Born in 1936, Bruce's family ran a successful automotive business in Mundelein, Illinois. Bruce's father had a gas station that was established in 1930-something. It was a big standard oil with a car wash, gas pumps, auto repair. And then as the kids grew up, they worked for the dad. Like his parents, Bruce had ambition and a strong work ethic. Eventually, he decided to strike out on his own in the nearby community of Libertyville. He worked as a bartender and driving tow trucks. That was probably his in to the automotive business is driving the tow trucks because it can be lucrative. Eventually, Mr. Rouse was a successful businessman. He had a gas station right in downtown Libertyville. Uh, he also had another auto-related business that was a couple miles west of there. My father had the gift to gab. He got along with people very, very very personable. From the beginning, Bruce wanted more than a successful business. He also wanted a family. 
In 1959, he married his high school sweetheart, Darlene Stenland. My father was the youngest in his family, and she was the oldest. So she's, you know, used to taking care of the younger siblings, and he's used to being the baby of the family. There was a dynamic there, you know, that worked in some ways. And, uh, yeah, they fell in love. In 1960, the couple welcomed their firstborn son, Kurt. Three years later, they had a daughter, Robin, followed by another son, Billy. You know, the family, the rearing of the family, the, the household to Darlene. Even though my mom could be tough on us, um, she was very protective. You can count on her. As the family grew, so did Bruce's financial portfolio. He was able to purchase real estate, and he invested in local cable TV. So he was able to take success in one business and turn it into others. In 1975, Bruce's sharp business sense allowed him to move his family into an eye-catching 13-room colonial home. We did a lot of upgrades, fixed up the rec room. My mom put carpets down and did the walls, and she liked doing that kind of stuff. It was a multi-story house, long driveway leading in. It was set in a place where everyone could see it, just off Milwaukee Avenue, near Highway 137. It was uh, on six acres. We uh, put in an indoor pool. We had pool parties. My parents would have parties there. Family get-togethers. My dad was really generous. I think when we look at the Rouse family, we're looking at the American dream. For the Rouse children, maintaining the perfect lifestyle wasn't always easy. I grew up with the threat of uh, being sent to military school, which, you know, my grades weren't very good, so no military school probably would have taken me. Kurt's appearance was pretty wild at the time. He had a great big bushy beard and wild bushy hair. After graduating from high school, Kurt moved out of the family home, but he didn't go far. There was a garden house down at the bottom of the property. I moved my uh, waterbed down there and my musical equipment was loud, so I could have the freedom of playing loud music down there. By contrast, Kurt's sister Robin was excelling at a local prep school. I don't know that she was so favored. It's just, she just didn't get in trouble. The cops were never calling. We got Robin down here, you know. Their youngest, Billy, was trying to figure out where he fit in. His struggles at school became struggles at home. I think Billy had uh, some learning disabilities, maybe a little dyslexia. And uh, also he was one of the kids who smoked and who got in trouble, you know what I mean? Probably a little mouthy in the back of the class. I mean, the track that kids, like the Rouse kids, are supposed to be on is the track towards going to a good college and being successful halfway. To keep his parents happy, Billy worked at his father's gas station. Bruce was setting up to give Billy basically his own company. Maybe Bruce was the owner, but he was going to give Billy some responsibility to do something. Because that was going to be Billy's company one day. Bruce Rouse was determined to set his kids up for success. Every single day he was at work by 5.30 in the morning. He always had the business open. He had the coffee on. But Bruce's daily routine came to an end on the fateful morning of June 6, 1980. His trusted employer, Richard Jewell, got to work that morning, and he noticed that Mr. Rouse was not at work. So he called the Rouse home, and Billy said, hold on for a minute. Billy puts the phone down, and within a minute or so, Richard hears pandemonium. He hears screaming, and Billy comes back to the phone and tells Richard, my parents are lying on a pool of blood. Now, investigators surveying the gruesome scene in Bruce and Darlene's bedroom. It was very clear that a gun had been put to Darlene's face. 
someone pulled the trigger um, and then shot across her and hit the father. We covered the bodies, just pulled the, we pulled the bed sheet over the faces um, and secured the room. While waiting for police to arrive, first responders learned that Bruce and Darlene Rouse's 20-year-old son, Kurt, also lives on the property. I was directed to go get Kurt in, in the caretaker's cottage. I had just witnessed a crime scene that I was still trying to get my head around. It was, it was uh, still somewhat surreal. I did not know what to expect when I walked into the cottage. suspect close to home there was a police officer with a gun aimed at my head i'm like what are you talking about i was very confused but they quickly learn this investigation is far from over it just didn't seem that justice was moving forward on this it was this tragic mystery that had gripped chicago and his wife Darlene murdered inside the master bedroom of their sprawling mansion. It was brutal. It was not, uh, not something you see or not anything that you'll readily forget. The couple's 15-year-old son, Billy, directs first responders to a cottage on the estate where his 20-year-old brother, Kurt, has been staying. I was sleeping and my brother woke me up. I think he said, Mom and Dad are dead. I looked behind him. There was a police officer with a gun aimed at my head. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? I was very confused. When we told him, he was just, couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. It was like waking up into a nightmare. We, uh, up to the house and we were there to a couple hours answering questions kurt said he was with his girlfriend that night that he was not at home we drove probably down to lake michigan and out by the lake for a while and got home um geez i don't know 10 11 o'clock or something like that he didn't know when this happened whether he would have been in the caretaker's cottage or whether he would have been out with his girlfriend, but he said he had no information. Detectives also questioned Robin and Billy. Robin had been at a school dance that night, and she didn't get home till very early in the morning. Uh, so her statement was that she had no information because she wasn't at home that night. Billy said that he had been out with friends and had gotten home about midnight and had gone to bed and had not heard a thing un un until he was woken up by the phone call the next morning. My assistant chief asked the kids if they had heard anything, and they said no, that, that there was a big storm and they didn't hear anything last night. The thunderstorm was loud. It was pretty wild. I just, I slept through, through most of it. It was very plausible that someone could say they had not heard a shotgun go off inside the house because of the, the constant thunder and the noise going on that night. With no immediate witnesses, police focus on the crime scene. When the sheet was pulled away, they could see the devastation that had happened to both people. With respect to Mrs. Rouse, she had been shot in the head with a shotgun. The shot probably been fired from across the bed from Darlene's side of the bed. There was also blunt force trauma uh, to the head, also several stab wounds in his chest. Based on the condition of the bodies, the coroner estimates the time of death for both victims between 2 and 3 o'clock that morning. With that information in mind, investigators formulate a theory about what might have happened. 
One of the possibilities is that there was a burglary that went awry somehow and that uh, Bruce and Darlene were murdered in the course of that burglary. It's definitely a house that you could imagine somebody looking at and thinking, oh, if I rob that place, I'm going to get something. Investigators find no signs of forced entry, but the family says the house was always kept unlocked. I don't know that anybody in, in the family actually carried a key. It was just that kind of feeling in Libertyville that you could just leave your doors open and no one was going to wander in your house. Investigators notice evidence supporting the theory of a possible robbery. Shotgun pellets embedded in the fronts of the dresser drawers would indicate that the dresser drawers were closed at the time that they were killed. Those dresser drawers have been pulled out. The bedroom appeared to be ransacked. Police begin questioning neighbors, but no one reports seeing or hearing anything suspicious. The neighbors said we could not have told the difference between some gunshot blast and the constant thunder that we heard throughout the night. For the people of Libertyville, news of the double homicide seems impossible to believe. The notion that a couple, a middle-aged couple, successful couple, well-known in the community, sound asleep in their beds, attacked, slain in their beds, just doesn't happen. While detectives continue to comb the neighborhood, the Rouse children wait outside their family estate. Out on the lawn, there are all kinds of people there, you know, relatives and uh, looky-loos and neighbors and people that worked for my dad. The striking image from that that I think most people around here remember is the police cars the crime scene tape and Kurt and Billy sitting on the lawn cross-legged just watching it all happen kind of sitting in shock on the grass within hours other members of the Rouse family arrive and remove the three siblings from the public eye when the investigators asked the children to come down to be interviewed they did what any family would do and hide Over the following weeks, investigators interview everyone they can find who knew or worked for the Rouse family. Unfortunately, the interviews generate no new leads and the case hits a standstill. At that time, it was still this tragic mystery that had gripped Chicago. And then something interesting happened about six weeks after this double homicide. Billy was now living with an aunt and an uncle. The aunt called one of the lead detectives and said, uh, hey, you know, we were talking to Billy. He was hoping that he could sit down and talk to you about the case. Two lead detectives went over to the house. And then at one point, Billy said, can I see the photographs, the crime scene photographs? And the officer said, Billy, you're not gonna wanna look at these. And Billy said, no, I wanna try to help solve this case. Then he came to a picture of a chair that was on his mom's side of the bed. And he said, look at that. My mom put her purse on that chair every night before she went to bed. And her purse is missing. Then he comes to the next picture, which is a picture of a dresser on his mother's side of the room. And the dresser is fairly close to the chair. And he said, look at that. My mom always kept her jewelry box on the far left side of that dresser and the jewelry box is missing. Billy's statement is leading the police to believe, again, that maybe this is a residential burglary gone bad. Investigators asked Billy about other items that might be missing from the home, specifically Mr. Rouse's gun collection. Mr. Rouse was a hunter, and he didn't keep his guns in a safe. He kept them in an open closet up on the second floor with this new information from Billy, investigators immediately execute a search of the house. The police found that all of Mr. Rouse's shotguns and rifles had been taken from the home. The next day, we'd search some of the local bodies of water for missing guns and jewelry. And we'd walk part of the displays wherever that was near the house. It was muddy and dark and Nothing was recovered. 
there were searches of local areas looking for any evidence at all. Obviously pawn shops, other places that stolen items would turn up, were checked, were looked at, and, and there were no leads. Nothing turned up. It just didn't seem that justice was moving for evidence. Coming up, a huge discovery breathes much needed life into an investigation on the brain. He thinks, holy mackerel, these are the proceeds from that homicide. And rumors swirl about a sinister connection to a criminal underground. What else would explain this sudden rise to prominence was an involvement organized crime. On October 13th, 1980, over four months after the murders of Bruce and Darlene Rouse, investigators get their first big break. There were surveyors at the Des Plaines River. They had to mark the center of the Des Plaines Riverbed. As the surveyor was walking in the river, right down the middle, he tripped over something. And he picks it up and pulls it to the bank. What he finds is that it, these are very large, hefty garbage bags. Inside, the surveyor finds a jewelry box and a woman's purse. He opens up the purse and there's a wallet inside. There's $200 in the wallet. There's credit cards in the wallet. And he looks at the name. It says, Darlene Rouse. And he thinks, holy mackerel, these are the proceeds from that homicide. My desk at City News Bureau got a tip that there was police activity at the Des Plaines River and Half Day Road in unincorporated Lake County. And I went up there. When I got there, I saw Sheriff Brown, a handful of detectives, one other reporter, and a dive team. In addition to the two bags with the jewelry box and with the purse. All of Mr. Rouse's guns were also found. Police recover four shotguns and a rifle and turn them over to the Northern Illinois Crime Laboratory for analysis. Although analysts do not find any fingerprints, investigators have a new lead. It became apparent that whoever took these items simply took them to make this look like a residential burglary gone bad. Because if somebody was actually there to actually benefit from the things stolen, wouldn't they have perhaps taken the rifles and guns and sold them to somebody? Wouldn't they have taken the cash? That indicates to us that the motivation for the murders probably wasn't financial. There was some other motivating factor behind the murders. The rumor mill of Libertyville begins to swirl with speculation. Looking at the burglary as as, as a cover up for for a murder, happened in the mafia. For a long time, the Chicago Mafia, the organized crime family, the outfit is what as it's called here in Chicago, it had a strong foothold in Lake County. And there had been a number of murders in Lake County over the years that were attributed to the mob. So, is it possible that the Rouses somehow were connected? to some sort of illegal activity. I mean, what else would explain this sudden rise to prominence? I never heard Bruce was connected or anything like that, but he was kind of an entrepreneurial business guy. And um, so I think there was just sort of a sense that that's a possibility. In this investigation, there was no stone left unturned. Okay, Bruce's business records, telephone records, bank records, everything was followed up to the very end. There's not a speck of evidence that Mr. Rouse was involved in any shady business dealings uh, or that he was ever involved with any member of the mafia. Investigators turn their attention to another growing rumor. The community uh, suspected Kurt, the disheveled, hippie, older son. I know everyone thought that he had something to do with it. You know, their main focus was on her, you know, just because of, I guess, his lifestyle. My parents weren't thrilled that I had long hair and a beard and uh, that I, uh, you know, 
wasn't working as much as my mom wished it, wish I would. You know, there's some animosity, but I'm a good guy. I, I'm not a violent person. Um, no matter how they try to paint me as this awful person. At the time of the incident, I kind of remember being kind of stuporous and disbelieving. There was a lot of friction in the family. Stories were going on around the town. He had to be the one that did it. He didn't get along with his parents. He argued with his parents. Just look at it. For investigators, Kurt Rouse remains a viable suspect. There were also whispers in the community about his younger brother, Billy. Billy was a kid. He was a junior high and a high school kid. But we found out that he had his issues with authority. There were rumors that he had vandalized with a couple other kids. Billy was rebelling in his own way. Billy was drinking, was using drugs, was hanging out with, with other kids that his parents didn't necessarily or particularly. In sort of wealthy suburban kids is what you can maybe see in the Rouse kids, which is a sense of entitlement, just a sense of they could do what they wanted. There had been some discipline issues between Mrs. Rouse and Billy. She thought that he was on the wrong track. In terms of the reaction to the community, you had folks that believed it was one of the kids or more than one of the kids. You had folks that specifically thought Kirk was involved. You had folks that specifically thought Billy was involved. If one of the Rouse boys did murder their parents, investigators know it would be hard to prove. Much physical evidence in a crime scene has to do with transference, either transference of fingerprints, transference of, of DNA evidence, you know, of a variety of types of fibers, for example, off your clothes. You know, if it were one of the children or a family member, there's a reason why they're, they're fingerprints, why they're... DNA would be in their parents' bedroom. With none of the evidence collected from the river search or from the Rouse home providing a definitive link to a suspect, the case stalls again. Years pass, and with their parents' inheritance, the Rouse children grow up and try to move on. I lived with my aunt and uncle for a while and headed for California, where it was nice and warm. I was getting a check once a month. I was living on that, basically. But then, after that, I'd moved to Iowa and tried to forget about it. Just get on with my life. And, you know, if, if you dwell on something like that, it, it makes you, um, it destroys you, really. There was an insurance policy on the parents' lives. And at the conclusion of the settlement of the insurance policy, each of the three children inherited money from that insurance policy. Each of the Rouse kids inherited $300,000, but one of them will not live long enough to spend it. Coming up, tragedy strikes again. All of those things that had been in the news two years ago came back out again. And a seemingly unrelated crime sheds new light on old wounds. They robbed two banks wearing the same clothes. So we thought, let's, let's take a shot at talking to them. children comes forward with a stunning development in the case. Robin calls them and says that she wants to come in and talk. She indicates that she believes it was one of the brothers, but she didn't say which one. That could mean that it's simply what she believes. Or one of her brothers may have confided in her and told her that he was the one that killed her parents and this is why it happened. That's potentially a great break in the investigation. But on August 27th, 1983, there's a tragic turn of events in Racine, Wisconsin, where Robin attends college. 
There were reports that they had offered her immunity. I don't know why they would give her immunity, what she knew that she would need immunity for, but the day before she was supposed to talk to the police, that night she was in a car accident, was killed. Robin Rouse was driving on a, another rainy night. She lost control of her car and, and hit a, a pole. The common story in the public was that she was murdered. You know, that Robin was going to talk about who killed her parents and that they killed her. And once again, you know, the common bad guy in public opinion is Kurt Rouse. There was a uh, Iowa State police officer at my door who informed me your sister's dead. I don't think it was so much about telling me as just knowing where I was. I was living in Iowa. I wasn't even in the same state, right? But it's just that's the way people think. Law enforcement came out pretty quickly afterwards and said that it was, in fact, an accident. There was an expectation, perhaps, that she could help solve the case. And her death ended that speculation. In the years following Robin's death, the dark legacy of the Rouse family murders and the mansion on Milwaukee Avenue continues to grow. I remember people talking about that building as the Rouse murder mansion. It sat vacant, almost like some sort of a a haunted house that was just a, a terrible, eerie reminder of the crimes that had occurred there. For more than a decade after the murders, the Rouse case remains unsolved. Through the years, the investigators would take a look at this case from time to time to take a look at it. Is there any, you know, can we look at the, the evidence itself to see are there any technological changes that may give you a piece of evidence that links it to a certain person? In May 1995, a newly formed Lake County Task Force begins reviewing the case. Kurt at that time was living in California, and Billy was living in Key West, Florida. As this cold case review is going on, Billy gets charged with armed robbery. He was with a couple of other guys, and they robbed two banks wearing the same clothes and Billy was brought in, and he admitted to hiding the gun. A decision was made to go down and take another look at Billy Rouse. The focus wasn't necessarily to sit down with Billy Rouse. It was more of to rebuild Billy's life over the past 15 years and to talk to everyone that he had come in contact with to see if that at any time he had said something, something that could give us a lead or could further the case. Through interviews with known associates of Billy Rouse, investigators construct a timeline of his adult life. Billy went down to Florida and kind of lived kind of the Margaritaville life. I talked to his ex-wife, and they were kind of a young party couple. They uh, but got married, got a house, had a kid, but his drinking got worse. By the time he was arrested, he had no money, was living in a shack and was really at the end of the line. So after talking to all of these people and coming up with nothing, you know, we're in Key West, we try one last chance to see, is Billy going to talk to us? Will he sit down and will he talk to us? On October 12, 1995, Libertyville investigators arrive at the Monroe County Sheriff's Office to interview 31-year-old Billy Rouse about the night his wealthy parents died. We arranged for Sergeant Scott to conduct a polygraph examination of Billy that afternoon. Billy was very open, was talking to him very concisely about what had happened that night of June 5th into June 6th of 1980. Investigators are astonished when Billy's account of that night now includes a shocking new detail. Billy had taken Sergeant Scott to the point where he was standing in the doorway of his parents' bedroom with a shotgun in his hand. At that point, Billy had broken down, didn't want to continue the conversation. 
next day. On day number two, as the officers are walking towards the interview rooms, Billy is now being escorted in from the jail at the same moment. And both camps are walking towards the hallway and they meet outside of the interview room. And Chuck Fagan said to Billy, Billy, you started to expose the devil yesterday. Let's bury him today. The time is 10.30 a.m. We're in the criminal investigation division of the Monroe County Sheriff's Department in Key West, Florida. They set up the recording and then they sat down in the room. And then on tape, Billy essentially gave the full version of what had happened. Billy said that he had come in drunk that night and high, and his mom would confront him immediately. She walked out of me and said, she smelled like liquor. I said, yeah, what about it? I said, I didn't want to work. I did what I had to do. Okay. And then she said, yeah, don't worry about it. You're going to be shipped out to the military school. I'm just over it. You f***ing moron. Billy described about going up into his bedroom, about how he drank some of his dad's whiskey, which was a common occurrence, according to him, and ate some, some psilocybin mushrooms. And he was just angry, angry at his mother and trying to decide what he was going to do. Coming up, after 15 years, the truth comes out. He's got the gun across his lap, staring at his parents. I'm saying I'm sick of this bullshit, man. Out of here, I'll get that out of my life. One of the two. The perils of wealth, privilege, and youth are finally revealed. Money tends to remove a sense of consequence. After the death of his wealthy parents in Illinois, 31-year-old Billy Rouse, who is now destitute and living in Florida, is finally ready to come clean about the night his parents were murdered when he was only 15. So, what's going through your mind? I'm sick of this bullshit. Man. I'm sick of this bullshit. 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 He then goes downstairs and he grabs a knife out of the kitchen. So I went upstairs and rocked her up. I'm going through the closet, moved out the saddle out of there so I could get into there because I'm going to go back further. I took the semi automatic, loaded that up. What kind of semi automatic, though? 16 gauge. Okay. He says he walks into the doorway of the bedroom and he's staring at his parents. His statement is then he sits Indian style, his words, Indian style, on the floor. And he's got the gun across his head, staring at his parents. And then he says he gets up and he goes over to his mom's side of the room. Took the 16 guys, put it up to her head. starts to convulse and Billy said he didn't like seeing that so he goes around to his dad's side of the bed and takes the butt of the gun and he hits him in his forehead as hard as he can and his father was still convulsing. I don't want to be misery. So I got the knife and I stab him and then went to a his parents he was obviously confused and trying to figure out what to do so he thought that he would make it look like there was a burglary. Billy tells police he dumped the evidence in the Des Plaines River then drove home. Are you sorry that your parents are dead Bill? 
Yes and no. Can you explain that to me? Yes. And then what do you mean, no? Yes, because the s I had to deal with them was gone. And that was kind of a relief for me. And then, no, because it really f***ed up my sister. And what about you, Bill? was the last thing I would have guessed that he was going to confess to this crime. I never thought my brother could be guilty of, that, of this crime. When it came out in 1995 that Billy confessed to the killings, I think there was a sense of relief. But the sense of innocence that had, had existed in Libertyville for so long was shattered with this murder. On August 10th, 1996, Billy Rouse is found guilty of murder. But questions remain. What was deep down going on that a 15-year-old that a boy felt compelled to kill his mother and his father in anger? I don't know that we'll ever know what the specifics were that led to all this. I wasn't a rich kid, but I grew up around rich kids, and so... I can remember being at that trial and, and hearing about the, that family and thinking, you know, I know who those kids are. Money tends to remove a sense of consequence. I got the impression that, yeah, he felt like he was a little bit above the law and, and that them having everything they, they could want made it easier for him to do what he did. I have no doubt that the fact that they were rich had a lot to do with it. I think it was just the, the, the right combination of drugs and alcohol. I think the right pitch to the argument between he and his mom. I will say this, that our society absolutely fails in the area of mental health treatment. I think that this one case may be just one more example of how we failed some of our, our fellow citizens. I just feel sorry for my brother, regardless of what he did. Guilty, not guilty, I just feel sorry for him. It ruined his life, it ruined mine, it ruined my sisters, our relatives, you know. All of us, we just, we lost so much. For more information on Snapped, go to Oxygen.com.